Hey, what's up? Uh, for this this uh, video right now, we're going to be doing uh, four tables of 1026 max. We're continuing the series uh, that I started with uh, basically six max no limit strategy, moving up through the limits. Uh, last week we did 510. Sorry, not last week. It's been a long delay because I went on vacation or I was on a poker trip, whatever you want to call it. Um, so a couple weeks ago, three, four, five, whatever. Uh, we had a video uh, where we did 510 NL, and I started, you know, I, I, if I remember correctly, I talked about how once you get to 510, you start seeing a lot of professional players, a lot of grinders, people who do this for a living. Um, as You know, there's obviously a ton of people out there who play poker for a living, and once you start getting through the mid limits and getting to like the lower high stakes tables, like 1020, that's when you really see a ton of professional players. I mean, this table right here on the upper right, um, it's, you know, through, I mean, Gaucho technically is not a professional because he has a job, but he's basically a professional, um, you know, Mizzles, uh, I don't know if his ident identity is revealed or not, but he's a, I mean, I know who he is, but he's a professional player, Mr. Doodles, he's always on, he's always playing, he's a pretty good grinder, he's basically like, you know, a tight aggressive player with a little bit of crazy in him, which is a good recipe for being a good player, um, and then David Benefield is uh, is Raptor. That's his uh, his real name. Raptor. I mean, sorry. David Benefield's his real name. Obviously, he's he was used to be. Uh, uh, what was his? I can't remember his his full tilt name. Uh, I'm gonna move table my switch my stars tables because the new one I just got is um, is 50 big blind minimum. So we won't have to deal with short stackers now. Uh, I don't usually ever play tables where there's going to be short stackers since it's amazing these days. You really don't have to. Um, you know, a year ago, a huge part of six max strategy was dealing with six was was dealing with short stackers, which really takes away a lot of the you know the beauty and the depth of of no limit when you do that because for the most part playing as short stackers is a it's like sit and goes. You know, it's pretty straightforward. It's it's mathematical. It's simple, and it sort of takes away from what what you really can can explore and do and 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 you know all the creativity that you can, that that six max and limit really allows you when you play it deep stacked, uh, especially when you're playing high stakes and you're playing as really good players. There's just so much more room to do things when you don't have short stackers around. Uh, so whenever I can avoid playing short stackers, I do. Um, so right now this one's three handed and the rest are six handed. So obviously in this table, if it stays three handed, but it doesn't look like it will stay three handed. There's two people sitting out. Another seat going to open up. Um, you know, it's, but I don't need to actually talk. I'm not going to talk so much about general six max strategy or four handed or three handed or anything like that because there's a million videos where you can watch where I talk about that. For what? And since this is part of the uh, you know the moving up, and moving down, whatever series, I really will just try to do my best to to break it down what the difference is between five ten and ten twenty and between ten twenty and twenty five fifty. Um, between 510 and 1020, I used to think that back in the day, like, you know, during party poker, uh, the, the golden age of poker, I guess I should call it, golden age of online poker, 2004, 2005, 2006, up until uh, October, basically, uh, there was there was an enormous amount of 510 and 1020 action. This is, way, this is before all the nosebleed action on full tilt happened. I mean, there, were, there was some stuff, but it was, it was negligible compared to what it is now. Um, in terms of ultra high stakes, and on UB there was fifty a hundred, but that was considered just like that was nosebleed at the time. That was a monster stakes back then. And uh, so right now, uh, you know, ten twenty and five ten are just pretty you know medium stakes these days. So back in the day, they used to be considered pretty high stakes for online poker. Uh, I'm just going to raise it up here with the king nine diamonds. Basically, it's, it's a pretty simple strategy. Just take the betting initiative with a with a reasonable hand, and uh, I'm probably going to get him to fold on most flops. And obviously, I have to give up now. And uh, so, anyway, and it used to be, I think, that uh, there was a, a real uh, a huge divergence between five ten and ten twenty. There was just a big difference in skill level when you when you made that jump because you know at the time when party poker and poker stars really all they had was five ten and ten twenty for high stakes. That meant that the best players on on the site were playing. We're playing those stakes. Uh, I'm obviously shoving here. This isn't even close against anyone. 
And I'm probably going to lose if I don't hit an Acer King, and then he snap called and probably has a pretty strong hand. For some reason it's not loading. Oh, straight on the board. That's great. Anyway, um, and I used to I used to really say that the, the biggest difference in like all of online poker between any two stakes and any two game in any game really was the difference between five ten and ten twenty. It, it always just seemed like it's the biggest jump in the world for me, because right around the time when UIGA passed and ruined everything and party poker went down for Americans, uh, I was playing about I was playing five ten around then like end of oh six, and I would occasionally take ten twenty shots, especially on party. <laughs> And I always was just amazed by how much better the regulars were. In terms of fish, you know, the, the, the really weak players in the games, you know, those, those guys you're going to see everywhere. High stakes or low stakes, it doesn't matter. The difference, you know, really what moving up is about is learning how to play against the best players. Uh, obviously, you sh you'll learn how to, how to maximize your, your value against the weaker players as well. But, but that's, that's really the easy part. The tough part when you're moving up is learning how to, learning how to, to react to really, really good players, basically. Uh, right now, I'm probably going to play this deep table instead of the stars table, because like I said, the deeper the better. Although I am running ridiculously short on full tilt. I can never seem to have an upswing on both sides. I always lose on one and win on the other. Um, so hopefully I don't get stacked too many times because I'm... Then I'm going to be even shorter than I already was. All right, so I'm raising here against Gasser, the King Queen off, just because he's in position, so he's going to call with a lot of hands which I dominate. So a lot of people generally think that a hand like King Queen goes down in value when you're this deep, and it's true to a certain extent um, because of Ace King and Ace Queen. But the thing is, when you're playing in, in this situation, I'm far more likely. For, to to see to, for him to it's far more likely that he'll have a hand like, uh, you know, King Jack suited, King Ten suited, Queen Ten suited, Queen Jack suited, than Ace King or Ace Queen in this spot. Especially given that it's hard for him to have Ace King because he didn't he didn't re-raise pre-flop. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's important that a lot of the traditional things that people say about you know dominated hands, and which hands are dominated when, you really have to think about it more situationally. It's not just that a you know a hand like king queen or a hand like king jack is a dominated hand. Like you know, anytime you get in a big pot, you're gonna be dominated. That's that that sort of old school, uh, idiotic thinking about poker that just doesn't take it as, as a situational game at all. But anyway, I, what I really wanted to talk about more than just uh, general six math strategy is how to adjust when you move up. Now, just with every single move, jump and stakes, it's the same thing. The same general thing happens. It's more aggressive and it's it's a little bit more. Uh, you know, it's it's. I, I'm trying to figure out the right combination of, of words. It's it's not that it's tighter or looser. I mean, you, you yeah, you're probably going to see players playing uh, on average tighter when you move up in stakes. That's only you know a preflop thing. You you know you get people have more um, more sound preflop strategy than they used than they do at lower stakes. They know how to they they don't they don't make as many just pure exploitable mistakes. You know they don't they don't call with with pocket pairs when they obviously shouldn't when they don't have enough implied odds or you know they don't call re raises out of position with ace nine offsuit things like that. Although you know some players actually do. And that's that's the thing is that when you as you move from stakes. You find more and more just straight up grinders, but you still have to worry about those like you know those dur type players. Wow, that is a sick cooler for for the guy with seven eight of spades. Um, so even uh, like I was saying, even though you know there's this there's a uh, even though there's a general trend that people get tighter, you still have to worry about those those incredibly good loose aggressive players, which you do not find at lower stakes. Anytime you see pretty much see somebody playing loose and aggressive like a lunatic at lower stakes. You know, five, ten, even three, six, two, four. Almost always, those should be a bad player, and that's why they're playing with so many hands. When you move up in st stakes, and once you get to ten, twenty, you start encountering some like some really good lags, some people who really know how to play a lot of hands and know how to play it well. Uh, and ten, twenty is really like I'd say the lowest. It's I think it's a good point to stop this our, our this series as you know the move up through limits because ten, twenty is really. Your first step into high stakes, I think, because and, that, and by that I mean you see a lot of the same sort of 
see a lot of the same things going on in these games that you would pretty much at any stakes up to you know five hundred a thousand a lot of the same same general uh, strategy and and you know you see people making hero calls with ace high and king high and all that crap and you see people making really elaborate complicated bluffs so you sort of have to just be you know just be smarter about the game basically it's just your first step in moving up you gotta you gotta expect more from your opponents you gotta know that they're thinking you know it's just something that I, I I've always been it's just always blown my mind when I when I'm talking to people about poker who are who just don't quite get it is that you know they're they're thinking about their hand in just in just a completely one dimensional way they don't think how is my opponent going to perceive this and obviously if you're already playing five ten or three six two four you're well beyond that and you know that but I think it's just important to note that even if you are beyond that and you're always constantly thinking about what your opponent thinks of you, it just becomes even more important when you move up in stakes because they're thinking about it too, and they're thinking about what you th you're thinking, they're thinking about, and so on and so on. And it keeps going back and forth. Uh, and it, I think it's there's no better way. I, I, I know I say this all the time. There's absolutely no better way to learn how to play to become a good six max player than becoming a good heads up player first. Because when you once you become a good heads up player, you really get. In, you know how to get into your opponent's heads because that's what so much of heads up is about. And you really learn how to how to play just pure aggressive poker and just and, and know how to know how to you know just keep keep putting a maximum amount of pressure basically at all times, but still not being not being overly aggressive. And and if you can take that those that basic skill set and translate it into six max, you're just gonna be a much better player than if you just than if you never try to switch basically so right here if nutty raises I'm gonna call with five three dimes because I have position and five three dimes isn't I mean, it's not a great hand but it's it's fine if you're in a blind versus blind when you have position You know, and, and it, this is like just going to be about one of the most obvious things I've, I've said in any of these videos. But once you move up from ten twenty to five, or from five ten to ten twenty, you're going to notice that people are just better. And I mean, of course, that's a big thing. But they're just better in every way, really. You know, they, they, they you'll notice that they they three bet in spots that make it really difficult for you to play your your pre flop game. They four bet you in spots where you know, it's really, it makes it really difficult for you to play your standard three betting game. And when they know, you know, and when you start four betting them like crazy, they're gonna they're they're gonna have the balls to to stick it in real light. They're gonna know that you can that you can be four betting light. And it's just there's certain players at lower stakes. Fuck me. There's certain players at lower stakes that just simply will never ever four bet you light, and certainly will never five bet you light. And once you get to higher stakes, you just can't you can't even expect that. I mean, hell, you you can there's gonna be spots when you're super deep against certain players. It wouldn't be crazy to see them six bet bluff you. Um, and that just that you know that I'm not saying you're gonna get six. You should be expecting to get six bet bluff when you're in when you're playing uh, when you're playing six max ten twenty or anything like that. It certainly hardly ever happens, but. Just to keep in mind that if you're playing somebody like this guy, David Benfield, I mean, he's capable of, of pretty much any play. You know, he, if he thinks it's going to be plus EV, he's going to do it. And that's that's just basically one of the big differences between 5, 10, and 10, 20 is that everyone is just capable of way more once you get to 10, 20. You start dealing with really, really good players. Um, you know, the fish, there's always going to be fish. There's always going to be these random people who don't know what they're doing. But you just got to deal with, you know, learning how to play against people who are just... I mean, a lot of people would put David Benfield as you know one of the one of the top ten NL players in the world. I certainly would, and and he's playing ten twenty just because it's high enough stakes that if you're playing you know ten, eleven, twelve tables of it, you can easily be making over a thousand dollars an hour. And if, so if there's a ton of tables running, you're going to see some incredibly good grinders playing, just because it's worth it for them. It's high enough stakes that it's just that's it. It's just it's all about the money, you know. And I really have had absolutely no interesting decisions so far. So I apologize for this be this video being mainly just me running my mouth. Hopefully this king queen will allow me an interesting decision. 
And it's folded around. That's just great. Ideally, I'd like to start making some PLO videos because I've been playing a ton lately. And I think my, my first PLO video, I'm going to do it with uh, Learn From TV. We're going to do a, a dual video uh, where he watches me play, I guess, and tells me how bad my fundamentals are. Because I'm pretty sure I still have some pretty bad fundamentals in, in Potlum and Omaha. The big jump for me, right, really, from when learning it is basically just been... Um, I don't even know what the big jump is. I don't even know where I was going with that. That was a stupid way to start a sentence. Um, it's just, but something a lot of what I've learned is is just basically learning trends, learning how people, the type of bluffs that I frequently see people making. Because you know, I know exactly how people tend to play in no limit with these stakes. But in PLO, I'm not sure just what just yet how people are, react to most actions. Now, great spot in in six max. Oh God, please don't shove. Oh God. A great, as I was about to say, a great spot in six max for making uh, re-steals is once a player's already limped, because especially nowadays, because you really don't see good players limping almost ever, except well, you will see David Benefield limping. He definitely limps, but almost, almost no good players limp, pretty much ever. And wow, I really should have taken a stab at that pot um, on the lower left. Almost no good players really limp ever. So what that means is. You're hardly ever going to see, uh, you know, when you, because of that, people who are in position, good players who have position on limpers, are going to just going to be raising them, raising, uh, raising to isolate them very frequently if they have any sort of playable hand. And because somebody's already limped, and you're and you're re-raising them when there's a player already, uh, two players already put money in the pot, they're going to be playing a little bit tighter to your three bets. So, and it's just it's just a good spot for it. And because you, because the raise size has to be bigger, it means if they want a four bet, either four bet size is going to have to be bigger. And I just flopped the crap out of this flop. I'm going to bet it. Obviously, this guy only is six forty five, and there's a spade draw out there. And uh, even even though I'm not that deep, it's still I think you should be betting this flop. And while it's not a great card, at least I have the king of spades, so I don't have much to worry about. I'm actually going to check this card because there's really no bad river card for my hand. The only problem is I might kill my action, but I think if he has, if he had his mediocre hand, I've already killed my action. That card, maybe I can get him to bluff. So I'm just going to check. That's an amazing card for obvious reasons. And my phone is ringing in the background. I really need to turn that off next time I do a video. I'm just going to put that guy all in. Hope he doesn't have quad jacks. Yeah, he had jack eight, so jack eight of hearts. Like I said, that obviously is a perfect river. And my reasoning on the turn turned out to be perfect. Though I don't know if that's not necessarily always going to work out. But like I said, that if I'm going to lose that, if, you know, that turn card may have already lost me a ton of action. In which case, I have to, I have to sort of just pray that uh, I'll get some sort of miracle card that'll help my hand, that'll help my hand get action, like a jack If he, in the case that he has just some random jack, or it'll be a spade and he'll try to bluff it with a jack. Uh, those are basically two, two of the hopes I have in that situation. So right here I uh, open I opened the blind uh, against Mr. Doodles, and then check the flop, and then bet the turn. Uh, I almost always just bet there when I have air, but I say every now and then check. Just because there are certain hands I'm, quote, you know, value checking. Basically, that means hands like kings, queens, jacks. you got to protect protect your, uh, or balance your range, whatever you want to, however you want to phrase it. And one thing to consider in in moving up in stakes, a really important factor, actually, I think, I can't believe I've mentioned this yet, is that the player pool is constantly shrinking. It's a pyramid. It looks exactly like, it should look like a pyramid when you're talking about higher stakes. You know, at the absolute highest stakes, you know, 500,000 and, and full tilt, there's a player pool of like 20 people, maximum. That, and that's stretching it, saying 20 people. It's really much less than that. Um, 
This is an easy call against David. Um, I'm sorry, this is not an easy call against David. This is just a call because we're deep uh, against a really aggressive player, and I don't think there's anyone who I would be fooling this against his stacks, but it's probably less profitable to call against him than against most people. He loves his small c-bets, and it's perfectly fine to do them in that sort of situation. But anyway, the since the player pool is constantly shrinking... Wow. What the... Okay, since the player pool is constantly shrinking, uh, what it means is you know, things like stats and and poker ace, in my opinion, become less important as you move up in stakes. Um, because you're playing against the same guys every day, so there's not—I mean, there's not that much that stats can tell you that you couldn't be able to figure out yourself just by being observant. Now, I, I'm fully in support of using using a HUD and using stats when, when you're playing low stakes and any time you play you're playing against five different people. But on every one of these tables I've played with everyone except for maybe one or two people totally. I've played with Mr. Doodles a million hands. I've played David a million hands. Gaucho I've played a million hands. I have probably actually played a million with any, but it's an exaggeration. Uh, Wurtzy Boy, he looks familiar but I don't think I've played him before. Uh, and same thing around here basically. I've played with Seabon. I've played with with Mr. Doodles, obviously. I play with Go, 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 Go. And uh, Nomad, I definitely play with him, though I can't exactly remember how he plays. Um, but e anyway, just the fact that I already know how the others, these everyone else plays, it means that when there's just a couple, you know, one or two outliers, those, those other people that are playing that I'm not used to, I can focus more on them and less on people like Mr. Doodles because I can just watch how somebody like Nailgunner, who I haven't played with before, is playing. And I get, and I just get a really good sense of their game without, you know, without having to to sit there and wait for him to play 50 hands, so I can know that he's playing 23, 18.6 or whatever. Mm, but either way, what it, uh, what it really another important factor that 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 leads to if there if you're playing higher stakes where there's a much smaller field, much more much smaller player field, I mean, is things like metagame become much more important. And there's a thread going on right now in 2 plus 2 in the high stakes uh, no limit section about this right now, actually, about the importance of metagame. And uh, right now is probably not when you're actually going to be reading this. Now, I'm going to 3-bet kind of big here. Not big, I'm only 3-betting pot, but it's because we're deep stacked and because David... It's a type of player that really likes to call four bets, especially in position. Um, and it, he really, really likes to call them, I think, wait, in, in this sort of situation. I mean, I, not, not him specifically. A lot of people would like to call in that spot more, more than uh, other spots because you're in position. It's blind versus blind. There's more, basically more reason to be ridiculously aggressive. And I, the reason I three, four bet that hand didn't just flat call or fold. I mean, I, folding is obviously just like a pretty normal response right there. But the reason I decided to 4-bet and not to call is because Queen-10 off, out of position, re-raise pot just plays terribly right there against a good player. Against somebody as good as him, it just plays awfully. Um, but anyway, what was I saying? So, metagame. Basically, metagame is just, you know, by definition would just be... What, what is with him re raising me when I have Queen 10. Uh, basically, it just means you consider, you know, you sort of consider in your grand scheme of strategy how, how everyone is going to play reacting to your game, basically, and how your, your actions throughout a session will affect how your opponents perceive your overall game and how that, and as a function of that, how they're going to, how they're going to play against you and how you should be playing against people, knowing what they know about you. And it's sort of like a, it's just, I guess that's the best way I can describe it. Uh, I'm sure there's a, oh, a better definition out there of what metagame is. But either way, I think metagame becomes far more important at higher stakes, mainly for the reason I just said, is that there's a smaller player pool, so, you know, and because players are better, so they have, just as you are going to know more of your players out there, your opponents, you're going to be more observant about everyone. So the same thing is going to happen against you, all your opponents. You're, they're, I mean, believe me, if you're playing 1020, I'm sure there are there's about a book of notes on you out there between every, all these other players. 
I'm sure Mr. Doodles has some note on me. You know, I'm sure David has some note, mental or otherwise, on me. Same with Gaucho. Um, and same with any of these other regulars who I play with a lot. And if you play with them long enough, they're just going to have more and more uh, ammo, basically, of how you play and what th- way to, ways to play against you. And if you're not com- constantly keeping up with how they're reacting to your game and adapting and changing, then you're going to get you're going to get owned, that's for sure. And that's really, I think, one of the most important aspects of high stakes. I think that's actually the biggest the biggest thing you should be thinking about when you're moving up, is, is what I just went out, went over. So, um, right here, uh, Nomad re-raised, and I flat-called with my jacks after opening, and C-bomb folded. I'm just going to call here on the turn. I don't think I'm going to call a river because he checked the flop. He, I doubt he's bluffing now if he bets the river. Cause he just he would have bluffed the flop if he if he had air, total air I think, but I'm not sure. This is gonna be a tough decision if he bets this river. Now, against a really really good player, I might call here. Against just a pretty good player, I'd probably just fold because I think a really good player is capable of bluffing in just about any spot and would balance even this spot, which most people just you know most of the times in this spot people are never bluffing because they check the flop. Uh, it's you know if they had it if they had total air they probably would have just bet the flop. Uh, the only hand I think you know maybe he might have here is something like uh, ace queen ace jack maybe that was uh, but even then I think he would just fire away at the flop. Uh, I think in all likelihood it's something like uh, king queen suited king jack suited maybe uh, some sort of king x hand that he didn't want to play a huge huge pot so he checked the flop thought it, he'd be deceptive but then again I could be totally wrong and he could have just thrown the crap out of me. So I'm just going to re-raise Gaucho and Mr. Duels here. We'll squeeze. When I'm in position, I usually just, I don't need to squeeze that. I don't think it's important to squeeze that that big. Um, same thing with just three betting when one person raises. When you're in position, just you don't need to, you don't need to re-raise that huge. I've been playing pretty aggressive pre-flop in this session, especially against Gaucho, so he's definitely taking notice. And this is what I'm talking about. Anytime you, 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 start, you sort of start just doing something frequently in a session, you obviously you just have to pay attention that you're doing it because these other guys you know they're they're sharp they're gonna notice too so right here I like making a little like half pot bet it's sort of it's somewhere in between a value bet and a bluff I mean it's not really a bluff in that no better hand is ever folding but at the same time uh, you know by check there's no real reason to check I don't think it, I mean I'm gonna get called by a lot of worse hands I'm gonna get called by draws. And chances are, you know, and just in a vacuum, I think betting there is plus EV because I'm going to take the pot down so often. And right now I get to check behind, and if it breaks, I can probably call this. Ooh, but against Gaucho, I don't know. Yeah, I'm tempted to value bet here. Uh, But then again, he, he, you know, he's, he's a pretty tight player, but he also knows how people perceive him. So he knows that, and he also knows that I'm the type of player that likes to value bet pretty thin. So something I think that, that I've worked on in my game a lot lately is is learning to sort of check back some marginal hands that I used to pretty much always just value bet. Um, good thing I didn't bet. I like his, I like his play there, checking. Um, no, I'm sorry. I meant to say I hate his play, checking there. Because I am not the type of player to be checking behind an overpair there. That is for damn sure. And if he bets, I'm always going to call him with like a 10, 10x or a jack x or whatever. But he's going for a check raise there. And I mean, come on, I am not going to put him on a bluff if he check raises. The only reason, the only times I like river check raise for value in in those those sort of spots is if you're if you know your opponent will be capable of putting you on a bluff, or your opponent thinks you're capable of bluffing. Whatever way you want to phrase it, I, there's no way I would think. That he's bluffing there, and I don't. I'm surprised if he thinks that I would think that. You know, it's it's just not the type of spot where where I'm going to put him on a bluff based on the action. I'm just going to get out of the way here, even though I think my hand has a pretty good amount of showdown value against these two guys in this situation. Oh baby, straight draw. So, I flopped almost Broadway. Hopefully, I'll turn it. I 
actually, hopefully he raises me, and then I get to call, and then it turns a nine, and I get to check raise. Now, despite what people think, even though this is an open straight draw and two overs to the board, it's not that strong if you, in a really big pot. And another thing to learn to remember about playing about playing deep tables. I mean, this is I'm 4k deep. If I were 100 big blinds deep, shoving here would be somewhat reasonable. I don't think it's good because any time you're called, you probably have six outs and not actually uh, eight or 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 uh, 14 or whatever that you'd like. Because if he has something like ace jack. Mm, all you know, one of my aces is dead. For example, if he has king jack, then then my kings are dead. So I'm just gonna call here. That's an interesting card. Um, makes my nine a lot less strong, just because an eight would be a one card to a straight. But then again, how can he really put me on an eight? Uh, but he can put me on a king queen. I'm probably gonna call this. Mm. Now his range, in my opinion, gotta be pretty, gotta be pretty polarized. He can have ten jack, he can have set, he can't have much else. He definitely doesn't have, say, ace jack, in my opinion. I think he definitely would flat call. Because of that, I almost like just shoving here, but I'm just gonna, because I, I think there's a, a good chance he's bluffing. I'm just gonna check, obviously, on that card, because um, now if he was bluffing, he's, he's definitely gonna continue on that card. I think. Or he'd be he'd be wise too, and I get to check shove if he doesn't shove himself. Oh God, internet! Oh God! Wow, he had king queen as well. That's interesting. My internet almost crapped out for some reason there, and I definitely would have killed myself if that happened. Um, so he had king queen. I'm trying to decide. I'm trying to decide what I th think of his play there. But it's another thing. Like this is what I'm talking about. Back to being what it's like. What what you need to do when you're a 10, 20 player. You know, immediately just make a mental note of the fact that this guy just played that hand that aggressively. He, re, you know, he raised the flop and then bet the turn with the king queen there. A lot of players, ten twenty regulars, would never, would never really play that hand that aggressively. They, they definitely take a much more passive approach. And uh, because of that, you know, you just mental note or otherwise, you know, it's just a good idea to to jot it down in your head or in a in a, in a notepad document. I mean, not a notepad. What the fuck? My head is all screwed up today. Um, it's just important, like I said, take note of it somehow, mental or paper or computer, or whatever. Uh, I, I will not name the person who this is about, but one of my friends who plays the same games as me, basically, he once showed me his Word document that he has, where he has a list, I swear to God, of like every single player I, I, I've ever seen online, and he has just a list of all of them, he has a notes on all of them. He has a dated. He dated every every addition to every note. He says when it was, how he's been playing against them lately. If, they, if he's been playing against them lately, and it's extremely impressive to see like that detailed, of of note taking about certain players. And you know, I, I just don't think when you're at lower stakes, you're going to see players with that sort of dedication. And that's part of the reason why I was saying what I was saying, or what, why they're just better in every sort of dimension. They just get poker better. You know, they work harder at it. It's just all a combination, all those things that, that makes them so much tougher to play against. And that's an awful card, obviously. Open straight draw I got there. I'm just going to check. If he bets small, I can call. There, he bets ha less than half pot. Nice. He's not, I mean, I could probably fold that river, but he just bets so small. I'm putting on an observer chat because I assume somebody says. Uh, 
Oh, they're making a uh, joke that David Benefield is David Benjamin. It's not really that funny. I just love getting pocket pairs, deep stacks. It's just so much easier to win giant pots flopping a set than pretty much any other hand in poker. Except for, I don't know. No, I'm pretty sure this, this is the easiest way to stack people is just flopping a set. I'm just going to take a stab at this flop. I probably wouldn't if I had ace high because uh, basically, when you even though I mean, they're basically the same hand strength, if I had threes or ace king here for some reason, if I ended up with ace king, but with ace king, you're not as worried about as many turn cards uh, because an ace and a king obviously help your hand. They're good hand, and they're good cards for you to induce bluffs on. But if you have pocket threes, if you have like a really low pair there, quite often you're better off just taking a stab because um, you get, uh, while you have the same showdown value as if you had as if you had say ace ten, ace king there, um, in reality you have less showdown value with the stronger hand with pocket threes because. Uh, by the river, chances are you have, you have a better chance of ha having your hand weakened by being counterfeited or by uh, uh, basically yeah, just by being counterfeited. And that's something that I learned in PLO. It took me a little bit of time, but once I learned it, it really helped. I realized that sometimes, it's, and this sort of, I think this helps me a little bit in, in, in Hold'em too, as a concept that I never really thought about, is that in PLO, sometimes it's best just to bet not necessarily for value, not necessarily as a bluff, just to bet because you might have like a medium strength hand which has a lot of showdown value, but at the same time not very many worse hands are call you. But it doesn't matter that you have that much showdown value because once you get to the river, uh, chances that you still have that much showdown value with your hand just go way down because because of the amount of possible draws on the board or because how many overcards can come to your one pair hand. So even though you're not necessarily betting for value, you're not necessarily betting as a bluff. You're just betting because chances are you're going to take the pot down. And I'm going to check raise this flop here with flop set. Um, you know, if he's, if he has, if he has any, any sort of ace with a big club hand, I doubt he's folding. Um, and I think raising a little small kind of that makes it look a little fishy that I can be bluffing or just sort of pulling a move. I flopped flush. I should have raised a little bit bigger on the flop because now it's now sort of an awkward stack size, but I'm just going to shove to make it kind of look like it could be a semi bluff. And that's a pretty thin call on his part. I mean, the only real hand he's going to see me show up with there that he's beating is, is basically just a big spade. Uh, I mean, I don't hate it against me because I'm sort of a lunatic sometimes. But just in a balance, I think it's a bit, it's a bit, a bit, bit too thin. Wow, I'm really raking in the money now. And he had a straight. I guess it's kind of obvious given the way the hand played out that he snap called the turn there. Goucher had six, seven clubs in that hand. Woohoo. I'm not going to lie, I was not paying too much attention to this table. I'm not entirely sure what I, how much I bet on the flop. 320. Uh, now, basically, when this sort of situation happens where an ace flops and your opponent, after re-raising, just checks the flop, it's already kind of suspicious that he has... You're, you mean, you already should be kind of suspicious that he has sort of 
queens, jacks, kings, maybe a weak ace. Um, when that happens, don't be afraid to just go balls to the wall, both with bluffs and with really thin value bets. Um, sort of try to get into your opponent's head and, and think what they expect you to do with various hands. Because a lot of opponents there, they love just check calling down with with kings because they don't think you're going to be value betting thin with enough hands. The way to counter that is to not really bluff that off them and just go blasting away with pretty much any ace. And, you, and, and yeah, for, that's pretty much it, just any ace. Um, and then sometimes some opponents they'll they'll just pretty much check call the flop no matter what in that spot and then always check fold the turn. So against those guys, you know, bet bet the flop with an ace, bet it with a bluff, bet it with that with whatever, and follow up on the turn when you want them to fold, and then don't if you don't want them if you don't want them to fold. It's pretty. I mean, it's, I mean that's pretty pretty simple stuff. But at the same time, I think people forget uh, forget in that sort of situation. It doesn't really matter if you're playing an exploitable strategy or not. You just you just sort of sort of get into your opponent's head and just play the best you possibly can in that in individual situation, basically. I'm going to play a couple more rounds, and we're going to call it quits at the, around the 45-minute mark of this video. Um, I'm looking forward to getting back to, to sort of the regular schedule of videos where I can just do whatever I want. Um, and uh, I'm trying to decide what I'm going to do. I'm probably going to do a PLO video, like I said, with Learn From TV. Um, and I'm trying to decide what other types of videos I can do. I don't want to I don't want to just keep doing the sweat videos though. They they tend generally tend to be pretty popular just to watch me as I do whatever I do videos. Um, I think moving towards you know, new ideas for videos is a good idea. So if anyone has any ideas, obviously just post it in the forum. And I don't know why I just raised 107 clubs under the gun. That was stupid. Every now and then, see, I'm very open about what I think the weaknesses in my game are. Every now and then I just do stupid stuff for no no apparent reason. Like I'll just no, I'm sort of, you know, not paying too much attention because I'm talking to you. And so I just, oh, I see 10-7 of clubs. I just raise it. I think it's better just definitely to fold that under the gun. Then again, there's some people who would always raise that hand. Wow, action is really slow right now. All right, so seeing as how nothing's really happening, I think I'm just going to cut this video out pretty soon. Uh, I hope I got enough across in this video. I definitely don't think it's the best one I've ever done, but... Uh, Hopefully there's enough uh, interesting there were enough interesting decisions to make it worthwhile for your time. Um, I think uh, I think I'm not going to do the 2550 video in this series, the moving up, just because I've done a million 2550 videos. So I don't know really what the point is of show, of showing it in the, in in this sort of in this series. Uh, I'm sure you can watch any one of my 2550 videos to learn some strategies for specifically for 2550. Um, beyond that, I don't think there's there's much to talk about uh, at 2550 that I haven't already gotten across. So I'll, maybe I'll, that's what I'll do for the next like two minutes in this video. I'll just talk about moving up from from this takes to the next. So if you if you've watched this video and you've decided you've mastered 1020 and you're ready to move up and you have 200k, which I would say you really should have if you ever want to move up 2550, you should have like in your bankroll at least 200k. Not, you know, not like total money to your name, like bankroll, money that you would consider your poker, dedicated poker bankroll. I would not do it with less than 200K. I would not make the jump. I wouldn't even take a shot, I don't think. Uh, I think if you're just taking a random shot, if it's a super soft game, you can do it with 150, but definitely no less than that. Um, but generally, if, you're, if you think you're going you know, to try to make a move up to 2550 and stay there, 200K is the bare minimum that I think you should do it with. And even then, that's pretty much, that's really pushing it. I think for most people, you'd be better off doing it with 250, 300K. I know some players, some of my friends would say, don't even, don't even try it without 500K. You're out of your mind. And they would say, I'm out of my mind for thinking that you can, you can move up in stakes with only 40 buy-ins. It's sort of personal preference of, you know, of a bankroll strategy, basically. And, for moving up to 2550, it's basically along the same lines as moving up from 10 from 510 to 1020. 
You move from 10, 20, to 25, 50, you'll see, you really start to see a lot of the best players pretty much in the world, best six max players in the world playing. Because the player pool for 25, 50, um, it's pretty much the same, is, is, is sort of just like a little bit of a chunk of the nosebleed pair pool. Because a lot of players who play 25-50 also play you know, 200, 400 when it runs, but since it runs so rarely, when during the, you know, their day job, if you want to call it that, when they're just grinding, is when they're playing, you know, when they're playing 25-50, when, no, when there's no huge games running. So you're going to come across just phenomenal players all the time. And... All the, it's basically, there's nothing specific about 2550 that's different than 1020. It's just more of the same of what I just talked about earlier in the video of, of how you move up from 10, 510 to 1020. Same sort of strategy is going to go for moving up to 2550. You're just going to have to get much sharper. You're going to have to expect your opponents to be much sharper. You're going to have to play much more of a, you know, a metagame conscious game, knowing constantly how people are perceiving your actions, how they're perceiving, how you're perceiving their actions, all sorts of things like that. And it's just, you know, everyone just everyone just gets really, really good once you get at these stakes. Now, I'm being generous. I think that everyone's really good. There are plenty of grinders, and I think that's another important thing to to, to consider when you're moving up is picking out those guys who are you know absolute just sick poker players. You know, those are the guys you're gonna watch off watch out for. But then again, there's just gonna be some guys who are you know pretty tight, pretty good, but nothing special. You know, they're not that creative. They just get by. At, at these high stakes, they make a little bit of money, but they don't kill it. The reason that they're they're up there is because they're just you know they're just disciplined. They know how to play solid poker and not and not stray from that. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but they're just gonna be easier to play against than guys like you know David Benefield, for example, or uh, I don't know who else was I playing today, Estrati. Uh, just things like that. Those are the guys who you have you know you really have to watch out much. You really have to watch out for them a lot more. And the and whereas. Um, you know, there's going to be plenty of just nitty grinders who you can, you can relax against them. It's going to be a lot easier to play against them. Okay. So that's it. Now I'm sitting on all these tables. Uh, as always, just post in the forum, make a topic if, about this video. If you want to discuss it, if you want to tell me how this one was boring and I'm losing my touch and I should retire, or if you think it's amazing. And as a result, you made a uh, hundred K in a day. Either way, just let me know. And, uh, all right. I'll see you in the next video.